We were all in the year 1898. And 1898 was the year of the Philippine Revolution. A revolution brought about by the execution of Jose Rizal in the year 1896. But as I was telling you earlier, unfortunately things didn't turn out the way we wanted. Because even though we were winning the war, tides would turn and fates would change. And instead what would happen was that theocracy would leave us and this thing called democracy would come in and the Philippines would be eventually made in America's image. Wrecking ball. I love her. Wrecking Don't you ball. love her? I think we all have to love poor Filipina circus girl. But don't feel too bad for a Filipina circus girl, even though she's dignity challenged. Because please realize that there's no American holding a gun to her head. This Filipina is doing this by her own free will. will. Which shows you how much we loved American culture in the early 20th century. <laughs> but how did the Philippines get taken over by the United States? To understand that, you gotta look at Spanish history first. Because at the end of the 19th century, we all know that Spain as a global empire, <laughs> they were on a decline. And the reason why was because they had a leader named Alfonso, who spent all of their country's money and effort on two stupid wars. Two wars that Spain could never win or afford. And those wars brought them down with the Spanish-American war in Cuba. And the Philippine Spanish Revolution in Manila, and they were kind of losing both wars. And so to kill two birds with one stone, Spain signed a document known as the Treaty of Paris. 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 The Treaty of Paris was sent to Manila. Governor General Houdenes would sign the documents, pack up his bags and split. <laughs> because now with the signing of that document, the Spanish-American War in Cuba was over. Mm -hmm. But also with the signing of that document, the Philippines was uh, sold. <laughs> you were sold to the United States for 20 million dollars. <laughs> you know that's cheap, no? <laughs> this wasn't only for us, eh? but for the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Mariana Islands, and Guam. Oh. They got Spain's last five colonies for 20 million dollars. <laughs> Hala, buy one. Take, take uh, all. Take five. <laughs> and kablang, the beginning of the Philippines being made in America Seven. And our then president at the time was a man named um, General Emilio Aguinaldo, the head of the Philippine Revolutionary Movement. And Aguinaldo thought we were free of colonization because he saw the Spanish sailing away. And Aguinaldo was just about to set up shop in a palace called Malacanian. <laughs> when suddenly, a man named Admiral Dewey of the United States Navy. He showed up in Manila Bay and he showed Aguinaldo the receipt. Receipt. <laughs> <laughs> and said, move over, kid. We got a 20, new order in town. <laughs> and Emilio Aguinaldo, he would look up at Admiral Du and he'd say, ¿Qué? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Quién es, coño? <laughs> Whoa, said Dewey. Oh, dang, the critter speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. I say, I say, I thought nobody spoke Spanish in the Philippines. I thought that was a great mistake of the Spanish Empire not to give Filipinos their language. But as you can clearly see, though, for most documents in the Philippines from the 19th century, inside this exhibition, including the novels of our national hero, Jose Rizal. But if one knew how to read in the Philippines back then, you would all be reading in... Spanish. Spanish! Because Spanish was a language of any Filipino who had an education. Mm -hmm. Spanish was a language of Dr. Jose Rizal. Spanish was a language Filipinos would use to talk to the world and... And hey, we have 85 languages in the Philippines. Yes. We needed Spanish to talk to the next town. <laughs> and the Americans arrived in 1890. <laughs> and they took a look at all this Spanish in the Philippines. And they said, oh, Bizarre. 
<laughs> I say, why do Filipinos want to start speaking Spanish? Now that we've taken over Puerto Rico and Cuba, trust me, in a few years, nobody is going to be speaking Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can't live in California, Florida, Texas, New York City, or Ohio unless you speak a little Spanish. But back then they said, poor Filipinos. With a Spanish language, they can only talk to countries that are poorer than them. So let's do Filipinos a favor. Let's get rid of this backward gothic habit they all got called Spanish. Yeah. And let's teach Filipinos the more enlightened Tama language sites. of English. English. And that's why the United States send over these people. Tamasites. All right. Philippine normal now, school. Do so you see the white folk between the brown folk? <laughs> <laughs> okay, check out those white folks. Them white folks are who we call the American Tamasites. And the American Thomasites were the first public school teachers in the Philippines who sailed over here on the USS Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> and as I told you, the Thomasites were public school teachers. Because underneath Spain, education was only accessible to a few. But now with the United States, education had to be for all. So naturally, the medium of instruction of our new nationwide public school system was... English. So thanks to these guys by the 1930s, every Filipino boy and every Filipino girl in every Philippine province. <laughs> we were all now handed a book by Uncle Sam. We were all given a little primer that would read. Ballerina. See Dick. <laughs> <laughs> See Dick and Jane. <laughs> See Dick and Jane play. See Dick and Jane play in the snow. Snow in the Philippines? <laughs> See Dick and Jane eat apple pie while waiting for Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, a saint. <laughs> <laughs> While well, waiting for the snow outside. So, Filipinos were all learning English, but hey, those identity issues of a nation getting ever so exciting. And so successful was the United States in establishing English as the new Philippine lingua franca. Now, by 1915, English replaced Spanish in all government documents, birth certificates, death certificates, newspapers, and school books until after World War II. And one can look at the presence of English in this country in a good way and in a bad. Because in a good way, thanks to them, I'm now speaking to you in English today. <laughs> Ain't I? Yeah. And that's why you understand me in English. And why the Philippines is the third largest English-speaking country in the world. And that is also the reason why the Philippines is fast becoming the call center of planet Earth. <laughs> Correct? Yes. Amen. That's our number one job growth industry here. Answering phones for someone else. Because <laughs> call AT&T or Pizza Hut. And you're not talking to an American. You're talking to one of us. You're talking to some man from Alabon in a building in Makati at midnight. Pretending to have a Midwestern accent, sir. <laughs> And you cannot get an outsourcing job unless you're fucking in English. But now that the Pelofano was speaking in English, so no longer is speaking his fadis. <laughs> Alright? <laughs> Suddenly, any emotional, spiritual, or cultural connection we ever could have developed with that Spanish past. Severed forever. Because when Filipinos lost the Spanish language, hey, we also lost the words of Cervantes. We lost the poetry of Pablo Neruda, the novels of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, or even the original writings of Jose Rizal. You can't read them today. Because we lost that connection to Hispanic culture. And just as... <laughs> And just because we were being taught um, American English, 
Which is probably completely different when they speak in England. I heard. <laughs> it was really only the culture of... <laughs> Hollywood USA that would now become the most readily available cultural canon to the average Filipino. It would literally be... <laughs> Adios Cervantes! And hello, Cary Grant. <laughs> Who's really pretty. Uh -huh. Because as I said, the Philippines was made in America's image. Literally. Because we were supposed to be the 50th state. <laughs> of the United States, Bunyeta. <laughs> Not Hawaii. <laughs> And that's a hope we held on to for half a century. And just as every state in the United States is defined by their state symbols, one day in 1904, we woke up and the United States complete, conveniently chose the state symbol still symbolizing us today. So thanks to America, we now have a national bird. National bird. Eagle. No, 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 small Maya. brown, hot cake mix. Maya. Maya, very good. <laughs> we now have a national flower. We now have a national tree. No. We now have a national flower. Sampaguita. Sampaguita. National fruit. Manga. National animal. Halabao. And we now have a national hero. hero. Named Rizal. Jose Portacio. <laughs> I know. Because as you can see by the inauguration day of the Rizal Monument out of the Rizal Park in the year 1912. You can clearly see that an American flag hangs right beside the Philippine one. Ah. Oh. Which clearly shows you the concept of a national anything. It's really an American idea. Yeah. Because if the Filipino masses, oh, if the common man, the working class of this country was ever given their own choice, but then quite frankly, they never would have chosen anybody as distant, anybody as elitist, Anybody as conyo or pretentious as Jose Rizal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, think about it. The guy was from Ateneo. <laughs> <laughs> the guy spent half his life abroad. Jose Rizal would rather speak colonial Spanish. Huh? Jose Rizal was landed. Jose Rizal was moneyed. Jose Rizal was kind of 1%. Jose Rizal was also overeducated. The man spoke 17 languages. He was a writer, a doctor, an artist, a poet. Metrosexually ambiguous <laughs> and tried as an atheist! <gasps> oh my god, how boring! <laughs> oh my god, how boring! To any Filipino farmer. Uh -huh. Come on, any member of the masses would have preferred somebody less complex. They probably would have understood a military man like General Andres Bonifacio or someone like the President Emilio Aguinaldo. The masses would have preferred a man who held a gun in the revolution, not a pen. But the Americans didn't quite like these guys because these guys were just a little bit too controversial. Jose Rizal was the best, if not most, benign choice. Being as harmless as a writer, a doctor, he was just an artist, a poet. He was very westernized. Most importantly, <laughs> he was very dead. <laughs> <laughs> By the time the Americans got here. Oh, no <laughs> hey, because I'm telling you, man, you want to make a myth about a man? Let me recommend that you choose a man who's not around to screw up that myth. <laughs> and the Americans said, oh, we like Jose Rizal's style. Hey, let's make Jose Rizal the new center of the Philippine American Commonwealth. So the Americans would pluck out Jose Rizal's cold dead body out of Paco Park and plant to send his out. Where you still see him today. Hey, go visit him. <laughs> He's buried under the monument. <laughs> and now that the United States was in charge of our fate, <laughs> and no longer the Catholic Church, the Americans would also pull away kilometer zero from the crucifix of Manila Cathedral. And today, kilometer zero is Dr. Jose Rizal. Mm -hmm. And so there, as you can see, that from the year 1912 onwards, all roads in the Philippines will now lead to the Rizal Park. And the center of Philippine society is now measured by the values of a man named Jose Rizal. And no road in the Philippines should ever blindly lead you into a Catholic church. 
is a pretty liberating symbol for its time. Because it's a choice that we can call <laughs> secular! <laughs> secular? Hey, we now see the separation of church and state in the Philippines, thanks to a country called the United States. Because really, let's give those Americans credit where that credit is due to them in Philippine history. Because it seems only the Americans knew what to do with Manila's economic advantages. In a world which took three weeks to get to Asia from California, your ship would dock here in Manila first before going anywhere else in Asia. And because of our immediate proximity, Manila would get all the great American firsts in the region. Manila would be the first city in Southeast Asia to have Hollywood movies. <laughs> Manila would be the first city in Southeast Asia to have ice cream parlors. We were the first to have hamburgers. Hamburgers. We were the first to have branch price. We were the first city to have movie theaters. But Manila would also be the first city in Southeast Asia to have multi-level luxury department stores made out of concrete, fully air-conditioned with Otis elevators. Uh -huh. But Manila would also be the Otis first elevator. city in the region to have a proper sewage system, telephone system, electric system. We were the first to have toothpaste and toilet paper. We were also the first to have a government-run public education system, public sanitation system, public transportation system. The Americans built us a train line, they built us a tram line. And say what you want to say about Philippine Airlines. <laughs> per Pal will always be Asia's first airline incorporated in 1941. We got the first airline in all the Far East. And watch Manila grow with the USA. Let's call it that. Let's call it that. All right, so here's a picture of Manila under Spain. Manila under Spain. And as you can see, it's all very beautiful in Manila under Spain. But this photograph that you see here was also taken at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. <laughs> in the business district of Escolta. It's not busy. <laughs> and where the hell is every... Sleeping. <laughs> Siesta. Siesta. <laughs> Which is really good for health. <laughs> really bad for business. And the first thing America without law. Because they come to Manila in 1899 oh, and see everybody asleep after lunch uh, and say, What the f? Everybody get up and get to work. <laughs> and suddenly the Protestant work ethic kicks in in Manila. And now there is life after lunch in the Escolta. And now you have electric wires. Now you got neon signs. Now you got a tram. Now you got the first Sayer sewing machine showroom in all of Asia. And check this out after only 30 years of American rule. Hey, take a look at Santa Cruz Church Bell Tower in the distance. Look at it again. In just 30 years, you're looking at the exact same street of a completely different city. It was as if the city of Manila had transcended 300 years of social development in just three decades. Because sure, really, underneath the United States in the early 20th century, we proved to the world we can do, we can, that yes, we can do miracles overnight. Because with the United States, we wiped out cholera in Manila, we wiped out typhoid in Manila, we wiped out tooth decay, we wiped out <laughs> illiteracy. Because please, no matter how poor you might think the Philippines may be, let me remind y'all. That as of this year, more than 97% of this nation can read and write thanks to the efforts of the American Thomasite. And the Philippines has one of the highest literacy rates in Asia. And that is how Manila would earn that name, the Pearl of the Orient. Of the Orient. Because just like a pearl, Manila would become this glittering jewel coming out of something rough and gothic. Yeah. And Manila became the New York City of the Far East. Because Manila became this crazy mix of Asian exoticism, Hispanic charm, and the best American technology that your money could buy. And in a geopolitical world where China's emperor was falling, and Japan's emperor!
<laughs> Too much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and Japan's emperor was rising. Anyone could still come to the city of Manila and you could have a clubhouse sandwich, a gin and tonic, a Coca-Cola at the Manila Hotel before you caught a Pan-American clipper on the bay to fly you back to the city of San Francisco. Manila was the decompression chamber between the Chinese East and the American West. But sadly though, do you see this beautiful city here? The beautiful city of Manila of peacetime, as they called it. 1920s. A city by the banks of the Pasig River over there called one of the world's most beautiful capitals by Harper's Magazine. It was a population that had, a, it was a city that had a population of one million people. One million Filipinos who now at this point had become multiracial, multilingual, multicultural. Living in a city so worldly, Manila had Belgian trams, German taxi cabs, Manila had Spanish cuisine, British banks, Indian bazaars, and American jazz. But we also had some of the first Art Deco and Art Nouveau architecture in the region. Mm -hmm. All of this set amidst those bamboo huts. Everything set in between those little organic houses and Chinese temples but one should also never forget that the city of Manila is the only city in the Far East to have seven Spanish churches and a cathedral <laughs> that were carved out of volcanic ash spiraling towards heaven inside a walled city we all know as Intra Muros But sadly though, this beautiful city would just be a dream. It was a beautiful dream that only lasted us around 300 years. Because that beautiful Manila would be bombed. Mm. Bombed at the end of World War II. Two. And beautiful Manila was never the same again. So ladies and gentlemen, come follow me to a bomb shelter here inside the Fort Santiago. And there as we sit in the dark, I will tell you what happened when a man <laughs> named General Douglas MacArthur came <laughs> back to town. Ladies and gentlemen, walk this way! <laughs> I'm taking pictures of you. Ouch. It's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Pahawak. <laughs> <laughs>